Yeah, just before we get started, I just want to say like like great work on on the anime. I know you've heard that a lot all uh week, but like fucking incredible. On par with Cowboy Bebop, I would say. No, like come on. Like we're, we're, no. I've I've heard because you have to understand this about me that I'm an anime fan for 20 years. And yeah. you know, I've made a thing with such an amazing, you know, a uh, uh, bunch of people, but I can't, like, this is nice to hear, but it doesn't really, like, I can't really register that as truth because, you know, I've lived my whole life in reverence to those things. And even the, the, the stupid thing is, like, I knew when I was meeting Trigger for the first time that, for example, Yoshinari was, you know, the mech designer for Evangelion. And the from, guy, and I was like, my hands were like, <laughs> like this. Right? <laughs> if nothing happens out of this, this is totally fine because I'll be able to meet one of my idols, and that was kind of the. So, I think we did good. I think we did well, <laughs> but I can't like, you know, there's a bunch of names thrown around, and it's like it's like this or like, I, it doesn't really register for me in that sense. Maybe for Trigger, it's way more easier because that's. You know, they've done this for 30 plus years. So for them, it's like, yeah, good. We did good. Let's move on to the next thing. But for me, it's a, it hits a little bit different. Yeah. I, I mean, it's your first anime, right? Yeah. So like, get, give yourself that victory lap, man. Enjoy the feedback on your work, right? Like, it's it's not often that you get like a significant percentage of the global population giving you feedback on what you've done right <laughs> well yes and no in the sense that you know i've been at cdpr for 10 years so i'm used to the cycle and the kind of the scale of it because you know witcher 3 and cyberpunk the game and all you know gwent and all the things that i've worked yeah. on they had a massive reach in terms of like people but it was never about like i want to say this is about me because it isn't but something that i've led something that I was like really involved with and wouldn't actually be here if I wasn't there. So, so that's, yeah, very hit, hit yeah. very differently because you're just not part of the team. You're kind of leading the charge. So that's kind of a, yeah. a different, uh, you, thing. you have a kind of ownership over it yeah. that you don't have when it's, it's something that you worked on as, yeah. Now I, I I understand that the first night when like it, it first started like gaining traction and people started talking about it must have been well fun. I had a Corey Balrog moment. I don't know if you're aware. The director of God of War, the the, the new one, Corey, they made a documentary about God of War. And the moment that Corey saw the reviews, because the I don't know if if many people know this, but for video games at least there's an embargo. Like people get the game the journalists and the influencers get the game, but they can only write about it at a certain point, right? Where there's, mm -hmm. you, know, you have this moment of like exact time was like, okay, now people will post what they think about your work. And he felt him filmed himself watching the reviews kind of pour in because they were doing a documentary uh, and like he cried. And I kind of understand that sentiment because when Edge Runner's embargo dropped, I was in a bus with my son. I saw a nine at IGN first. And I saw a nine at Games, uh, GameSpot. <laughs> and I cried as well, like in a bus. And I looked like a maniac because like, you know, my five-year-old son is riding with me on the bus. And then kind of this overwhelming feeling of, um, well, happiness, joy, but also relief, <laughs> like a huge portion of relief. <laughs> kind of came to, came to me because you never want to do something that nobody cares about. Like, mm -hmm. even if you do something risky and you fail, in my mind, that's way better to get a one out of 10, mm -hmm. get a six out of 10. Because a one means that you, you, you went there and you totally failed, but it's like you did that. Uh, yeah. So that overwhelming <laughs> feeling of like getting that validation of a nine was, um, yeah, it was, <laughs> I, I really, that was so weird because people were looking 
because I didn't like sob like crying, but I was like, Ugh. and and my son asked me like, Daddy, is everything fine? And I said, It's more than fine, son. <laughs> <laughs> And I tried to explain to him what's happening, and he couldn't. He kind of understood it, but I don't think he truly understood what was, what was happening with me, because he doesn't. Yeah. I can't show him Edge Runners for sure. That would be a very bad parenting kind of thing to show him. But I tried to explain to him because he's into cartoons a lot, and uh, he just started to watch Pokemon, and I tried to explain to him that that's what that, that he does. And he said, can I see it? And I said, no. And then he lost interest. <laughs> and that's cool. Since you mentioned Pokemon, that's a good bridge into one of the questions I wanted to ask, which is, I, I mean, what what you've done with Edge Runners is, is fundamentally in the same ballpark as the, the Pokemon anime's big marketing success. Like, I mean, we, we can both agree that, that Pokemon kind of changed the face of marketing forever and um, opened up the, the transmedia pipeline. And I know you're not necessarily a fan of that phrase, transmedia. You don't like thinking about this in terms of uh, marketing. You prefer to think about it in terms of art. But, like, you have done something here that goes against the grain by, like, not timing this anime to the release of the game by giving it time to to just be produced and be as good as it possibly could and and you put it out there and i don't think that you anticipated a hundred thousand concurrent players on steam more players than the game had at launch more players than the witcher 3 has ever had right like i don't think you anticipated that but like that's a pretty big deal in terms of how this is supposed to work as a business tactic. Sure. And I, do you think that the success of Edge Runners is going to have an impact on how game studios and other media companies approach these transmedia marketing campaigns moving forward? I think yes and no. In a sense that uh, Edge Runners definitely wasn't the first in in that sense because if you even look at like GI Joe, right? It was toys, and they decided to make a cartoon and add story to it, and then people connected to it very differently. And now you have three generations of people that kind of grew up on it and have nostalgia or connection to it. In that sense, so in the, I don't think it's very new. I think for video games, it's new because the previously the material was always butchered by people that didn't really love the IP. Where mm -hmm. I think right now we have three adult-oriented uh, kind of showcases, which is one in Castlevania, which didn't have a modern game, which were just yeah. you know done by people that were not really connected to that material, but kind of grew up on it. But then they added a, a very different spin. And the video game industry, or, or Konami, I don't think, really capitalized. Like, they didn't gain much out of it. They were just like, it's there, it's cool, people love it, that's it. Then you have Arcane, which is a gigantic success on all the ways. Because mm -hmm. people... <laughs> One of the things we have spoke about in the team is like, after Arcane came out, it's like, we don't want to be compared to Arcane. Because it's such a revolutionary blend because it's 2D, 3D mash that happened, you know, for the first time and with a budget of a Pixar movie, which also yeah. is kind of important, and where Riot really put all of their efforts into releasing this. So I think Arcane showcased that creators that are connected to the IP, because Arcane was created by Riot and Fortiche, it wasn't created by Netflix. Like Netflix was a platform that Arcane lives on, but they're not mm -hmm. created by, by that. And that's a similar case with Edge Runners. Like CDPR and Trigger created Edge Runners, and Netflix is a partner. They are the platform mm -hmm. that this, this content lives on. Because of that, Arcane was also very much integrated into it was integrated into the world based on characters that already existed. 
mostly mm -hmm. and you know some of them will i think become the characters that people know from the game like eventually in season whatever and edge runners was just a story told in a in this world very faithfully i think like capturing the things that were that were important for the video game but in generality it was capturing the essence like when you do a comic book in cyberpunk when you do a board game you try to do it that it stands on its own but it's very true to the ip not the coding it's just like the ideas behind them the love behind them and is there and i think because of that people kind of connect to it better so i think this might change that video game studios will trust themselves to start developing things and then go and of course ask for help and get partners because mm, mm. you know just like for Tish with arcane edge runners was animated by studio trigger and they you know we made that show together yeah, you... definitely right it's it's very very apparent that we made that show together but i think without the component of us or riot this wouldn't happen so i hope what happens now is that video games companies trust themselves with their material that they created and partner up with people that have expertise in the field to bring something new to life. Yeah, no, I, I really hope that that happens in the future too, because like I would love to see more series like Edge Runners and Arcane. And, and I like I just find it interesting that a anime release plus a video game update, not like a new game, just like a single time purchase product uh, that has been receiving free updates because you know, CD Projekt Red is really good at taking care of their uh, games over time like that. But like that, those just those two factors could combine to this kind of like resurgence of a game that that goes beyond both just releasing a new show and putting out a patch that everybody likes that gets a few people on board there's three there's three comments i think i have there if i can in yeah. fact sorry which is that one is i think there was a there was millions of people that were quite mm, they weren't sure that they can say that they liked the game because obviously the launch happened as it happened and nobody was happy with it and it was universally not okay to say i liked the game even with its flaws so i think uh, Ed, what Edge Runners has put forward is that the discourse has changed a little bit, or the vibe has changed a little bit online, where people are like, "Yeah, I actually like the game," because you have to remember that it was the fastest-selling game on PC ever in history, and mm -hmm. so there was millions of millions of people that bought the game, and I'm sure a big portion of it really loved it, but technical issues really bogged it down. So I think now they had the chance of like saying, no, actually, my adventure was cool. I liked it a lot. And because that <laughs> redemption arc, just like a tournament arc, is always <laughs> enthralling for people. Like they want it. Like if you sincerely see that people care about something and they really had a good time with it, they want to go and say that that was the case. And now I think in because of Edge Runners, it was a good time to tell that story, to hit that emotional point in the arc and say like, yeah, I really like the game. But also I think the second point is that, and of course not one-to-one, -one, not directly, but you can kind of continue your adventure from Edge Runners into the video game. Like you want to do the same thing, obviously the perspective is quite different, the power fantasy, it's more prevalent there. But you can visit the same places, you can hear the same sounds, you can connect them mostly to new heroes that you didn't know. And I think that extension uh, is actually quite important. Because if you mm -hmm. play for Arcane, for example, I love that show. I think for me, it's a 10 out of 10 show. <laughs> but I know my fantasy of League of Legends would not transfer from Arcane to the League of Legends video games. because. Yeah, it kind of transfers to the JRPG that they made, but yeah, not... definitely. I've, I've played Rune King, and it was excellent. And it kind of, yeah. yeah, you're right. It transferred to that experience. I didn't transfer to League on its own. But I think in Cyberpunk, it does. That's why Castlevania was such a missed opportunity for me, because I love that show. 
but I couldn't do anything with, with it because there was no new thing that I can connect to outside of the show. And I think that's one of the cool use cases for edge runners that is new and kind of managed to to do it. And spoiler alert, I don't know if we can talk spoilers or not. Should we? Can we? Mm-hmm. I, I think we can. I think I think people who tap into this will be interested or will have seen the show already. Because, you know, know, people go into the game and just kill Adam Smasher with a dildo. That's kind of the thing <laughs> that they do. And there's a lot of it in the video game. Uh, or take Rebecca's shotgun and just relentlessly kill, you know, and they reload save and just, you know, do vengeance and after vengeance on him. And I understand why. Like, it was written that way, so it actually would... <laughs> Kind of worked out <laughs> so way. that people would want to get him back. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm so I've been I've picked up the game for the first time myself, and I've been like just yeah. I, I I haven't gotten quite that far yet. I'm still in the early stages. I've definitely had that experience where I'm like walking past a random radio, and that song comes on. I'm just like oh, <laughs> <laughs> you know. Um, but also, I've. I normally approach sandbox RPGs like this from like the same gameplay angle where I'll do, you know, like I I focus on stealth and like speech skills and stuff like that. And I try to minimize my casualties. But with Edge Runners, the tone of the show kind of set me up for this expectation that like, you know, life is cheap in Night City, and like maybe I can have some fun with some gorilla arms and turn some <laughs> some gangers into paste. And I'm not, you know, I'm. It's not. That's not a. So I've been playing it more violent. I've been playing it less stealthy, um, and I think I've had a more fun experience because I'm engaging with Night City the way that it expects to be engaged with. And I, I, I kind of wonder if that's something that uh, you you intended uh, with David's story to like show people how to find the fun in cyberpunk, even as the the tragedy was playing out. Well, I think episode four. Uh, now it's called very differently. When we were working on it, it was called fun and games, and it was about the fantasy of what cool things you would do if you were a cyberpunk and you wouldn't be bogged down by this really heavy trauma that is happening to you because of the things that you did. Uh, so we specifically had episode four to showcase that, you know, montages of different things that you can do in Night City as an edge runner. And that episode specifically was kind of conceptualized as showing, okay, he went into this lifestyle. Let's some let's show the cool part of it, uh, instead of like, because then from five and six we go like super heavy, uh, but we wanted to have the like a, maybe not a breather because it's very packed, but kind of showcase that uh, that there's fun things happening in Night City. Like there's there is fun to be had being an edge runner, a cyberpunk, but at the end of yeah. the episode, just pull the rug. <laughs> of safety kind of uh, boy <laughs> boy does that episode pull the rug so so that does kind of work you're right episode four kind of works as like an animated vertical slice of what makes cyberpunk fun um and i like one of the things i've heard from like a lot of people about the show is like i i don't like time skips i wish there was just a couple more episodes of them having fun doing their adventures but the way I interpreted that was like episode four gives you the taste of that. And then everything that happens in the time skip, you can sort of fill in the blanks with your own gameplay experience. And that that was part of what motivated me to start playing was just like, OK, so I've seen how people get into this life. I've seen how it ends. Um, and now I want to play the middle of that. Right. That was. And I, and I think, you know, because also episode six, uh, while we worked on the anime, it was actually a pivotal point in every possible way. It was, the, it was the hardest outside of the episode 10 to make. It was the longest that we made in the terms of like how much work went into 
it 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 was the the, the one that it it iterated the most outside of the pilot maybe because the pilot you know because it was rewritten a couple of times let's say that that's the case uh so we felt after episode six like there's only two paths that we can take one is that we really sulk into the tragedy of it and we need a substantial amount of time to do it or something that's more true to david which is that he just the only thing he knows how to do is just run <laughs> right so he mm -hmm. runs he doesn't really think about it. He doesn't want to think about it. He does all the things that are symbolic to him, but he just runs. And for that, I think we decided that we don't want to have more time for this to sink in. We just want to kind of move forward and show, okay, he didn't deal with that at all. So that time would have been wasted a little bit in a sense that, of course, I think we could have built a compelling case for his trauma and suffering. But I don't think it would give the outcome, if it makes sense. Like it wouldn't amalgamate to anything substantial because he would land in the same place that we'd see him at, in episode seven. So we thought like, yeah. let's run with it because that's what David as a character would do. And from that point, yeah, you're right. There is like a, 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 a blank slate that people can kind of fill in and have a little speculation and, and kind of, think, okay, you know, how did certain things happen? So he he is at that point and where the characters are dispersed, like Lucy is no longer part of the crew and she's doing her own thing, which she didn't before. So I think those were compelling and interesting for us to kind of go into into that direction. Yeah, no, that, that I like, I think you made the right call, right? Like, I think that, that by just... Pl plowing head first into it it has a lot more impact than if it was drawn out because like we know where david's story is going from the start literally everybody tells him how it's going to end and like um and while he might say no i'm special i i you know i'm, I'm gonna be fine i don't think even he believes that fully he's just committing to it because he's he's committed to it right what other option does he have um and yeah I, I i agree that that would have been just wasted time watching him try to solve a problem that we know he's not going to solve yeah but um but i also think for uh, for him specifically it's like hmm, we we spoke a lot about what makes David special like is he special mm -hmm. and our conclusion in at least kind of the uh, the creative leadership was that he's somewhat special but he has uh, more endurance but the endurance comes from the humanity that kind of he got from his mom that he really loved her and they had a, even though a very tough but a good life in that sense that mm -hmm. they loved each other they were there for each other they didn't have the time, the luxury of, of, of money, but still there was a support network there for him. And then he jumps into a surrogate family. And again, he gets kind of, you know, a big portion of love and support uh, from them. And because of that, he can kind of, again, go fast, but he's not that special. In this. And we made sure that Adam Smasher makes it very clear that he's not that special, like comparable to a legendary cyberpunk from 2020. Like he's something that he's just a nuisance that is on the way, and that hurt. Yeah, he hate. But I think yeah. the logical conclusion of of a story of a street kid that is not that special. Yeah, even with even with the the fancy hardware. It's just a toy to a guy like Adam. Yeah. Um, but that's... See, I thought... Like, I, I saw some interesting details in that last fight that I, I, I thought were neat. Like, 
Adam can use a sand devastan, right? Yeah. But he uses it sparingly, like Jotaro does in uh, his fight with Dio. Whereas, you know, David's just going full bore with it the whole time. So it does seem like David has like a higher resistance to his hardware than even Adam Smasher does. But I, um, I we didn't. Or talk about it. That's how I read that. Because we did like we didn't have stats for characters and we didn't like we, we didn't plan it out that way. But my interpretation of the situation is that Adam just doesn't need to do it. Like he's just like chill. Because he knows that he can solve the situation with you know only the necessary resources that he needs to to have. Mm -hmm. Because you have to remember that the cyber skeleton was a prototype. It's actually a failed project. Like it's, they wanted to test it out, sure, but it was already kind of on the on the balance sheet. It was one of the like very uh, uh, things that will not pan out most likely, and that's why he's like, yeah, it's bang bang, and that's it for him. It's a toy. Yeah, and it's and yeah, a failed yeah. one in that sense. I think uh, a lot of people kind of want to do the power comparison to things. And also that doesn't work for V uh, in the video game as well, because in the show, what was important for me was that uh, the consequences just follow the characters, even if the consequences are not fun. Like, But when the video game, of course, you don't want to break immersion, but you have to have the power fantasy grow as you get stronger because the world is just throwing more stuff at you. Mm -hmm. But that's a inherent thing for a video game that is based on like, how, how cool can I be? Where in the show, if we went that route, I think this would be an inferior show in many ways because at the end of the day, sorry, it is a noir story. And because it's a noir story, like, the character cannot win ever. Like that's inherently inside of the structure. But what they can do is fight for the people that uh, he or her, he loves, he cares about. Mm -hmm. And because of that, David actually, I didn't think about it. I actually read it, read it on Reddit uh, that he actually he succeeds in all the possible way because Mm -hmm. He does go to the top of the tower, just like his mom wanted him. He does uh, become a, a, a legend in Night City, just like Maine wanted to be a legend. And then he saved Lucy and sent her to the moon. So theoretically, his dreams that he took from other people, he didn't have his own. He fulfilled all of those dreams for those people. So for mm -hmm. me, the end, of, of course, is very sad. Everybody was very sad for a long time <laughs> when we produced yeah. that. But I think it's the only logical conclusion for that character. Uh, so for me, that was really important that we actually go through it, uh, that we that we go that route. That that he die for the dreams of his loved ones. Yeah. Um, with, I, I I think there's some kind of poetry in Rebecca also dying for him to make that happen. Um, no, I wish, God, I wish she could have just like <laughs> killed Adam Smasher right there. Well, if you hadn't nerfed Rebecca. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think again, this was, um, I don't think it works in the video game exactly, but I, I think it works for our show uh, is that if you would wreak such havoc, you would die. Like, mm -hmm. Lucy survives because everybody kind of rallied to her aid, but they should have died. Like, if they, you've pissed off the, the, the biggest, baddest organization in the world, and with no regards to consequences of like nobody's going to you know accuse you of murder nobody like they will kill yeah. you instantly because that's just mm. the only thing that should happen in that sense and i know that's kind of relentless but to not break that suspension of disbelief this half the, for me it always had to happen and uh yeah. i'm always sad but i kind of am 
proud for her in that sense that, you know, she was brave until the end. She really stood up to her guns, literally and figuratively. And, yeah. and she did what she thought was right. And I think for a character to have that arc, it's always very f- fulfilling. That's why I think people kind of gravitate towards her as well. Is that, yeah, she did the right thing for her. Like, she she was brave. And I think that's the cool, really cool aspect about her. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Like, that she's not... She's not necessarily the most badass person in the room, but she carries that confidence and she puts that towards the people she cares about most. Yeah. It's interesting you talk about how David sort of achieved everything that he possibly could have within the context of what he could do. And when we talked about this initially, you uh, told me that Trigger brought the optimism Whereas uh, your team in, sort of enforced the cruelty of the city. Yeah. Um, and to me, that kind of sounds like the relationship between players and the DM, where they're trying to explore the best possibilities for their characters with their characters' motivations and abilities. And you're there to reinforce that that the world is there that that it's not just going to bend over and let them let that happen um i think that's an interesting perspective i never thought about it that way but i kind of we joked about this a lot that you know trigger is bombastic and they have a lot of heart and flair and we were like the really depressed people from poland of saying like no no you have to kill everybody <laughs> And there were, <laughs> so, so, but, but also I think, it, you know, we didn't want to lose that flair with Trigger because there was a certain point in development where I think they, they went into the world so far that the flair was kind of very dim. Mm-hmm. And we were, I personally was, was very worried about this because I, we wanted to work with them because of that flair, because of who they are and what they represent as creators. <laughs> so we had a really tough balancing act in a sense that we wanted this to feel grounded, to feel real, for people to can connect and for this suspension of disbelief to not disperse. But at the same time, like we want all the great qualities that Trigger brings to the table and finding that balance was actually extremely difficult. Because at a certain point, it was very fragile, that balance. But I think Mm -hmm. the best way we found it is in each episode, there are kind of showcases of like our strengths as as creators. And it seems that they mixed well. Like we brought, both parties brought their A A game and made sure that both shine. And sometimes it was really hard to do, actually. But I'm happy that uh, it's recognizable or it's seen. And um, that Trigger also knows that they created something new. Like, there was, it's, (laughs) they sent me a really, really great personal note after each, like, big milestone. And it was always my dream because when I went to the first meeting, I very blandly told them like, look, I've never ever thought that I'm going to be in the room with you guys and talking for the possible project. It's my really dream come true to even talk to you guys. (laughs) And they were Mm -hmm. kind of shy about it as well in a sense that they were, they're so focused on creating that they, you know, they interact with the outside world, but they're in this bubble of like, creation and some a white guy that actually speaks Japanese told them in Keigo that they're my you're my heroes <laughs> what mm. do with, with you guys and I think that uh, it stayed with them and they whatever we had problems or whatever there's something that we couldn't agree on we kind of went back to that feeling of, of that connection and it propelled us uh, forward 
uh, and I'm so happy that we managed to find that. Yeah, you both shine, but like at completely opposite ends of the spectrum, and it ends up coming together into something beautiful. And we um, go to space at the end, which I think was important. <laughs> I, I, I think I think that's that's extremely important to Mahishi. <laughs> what? So, question: Was that Imaishi, or were you like, we got to go to space? No, no who, that, who said we got to go to that's space? That's him. That's him. Hundred <laughs> percent. In, in the script, you know, we had a dream for Lucy, but I won't reveal what it was. But it was a different dream at a certain point in pre-production. But then Imaishi came in and said, like, no, no. Actually, she wants to go to the moon. And and we were like, you want you just want to go to space, do you? It's like, he didn't confirm. He was like, he just smiled. Yeah. <laughs> and that was it. But <laughs> but it it also made sense lore wise, in a sense that actually the colony on the moon is very independent. And you know, there's different corporations there. But they basically have no like real control, and Lucy, because mm-hmm. of her backstory, she can't really run from from the corporations because her skill set yeah. is just net running, and she always will encounter those huge entities. But on the moon, and they've invested yeah. too much in her too. Yeah, and, and the moon was like, yeah, it's like an alternative, and she knew it, w- it won't be like in the journey. She recognizes that. She really doesn't want the moon. She just wants to be happy with David. And the moon is just like, it could be anywhere at that point. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the anime, she's safe in that sense that she achieves that that, uh, safety level that for her was a huge burden always. Like she was always the person to cut her loss and just run. Not in the same way as David, like headstrong run because, you know, that's the only way. She was just like, I'm going to hide uh, and she doesn't have to hide anymore, even though it's so, it's such a heavy toll uh, on her emotions and her traumas. She don't doesn't have to run anymore and hide. And I think that's, I'm happy for her in that sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard to go on with, without somebody like that. But like, yeah, you can see that sort of mix of sadness and relief in her face in that final shot and it's it's i mean for all of the stuff that i think trigger does really well as an animation studio in terms of like making shit blow up and look the coolest ever i think it's that ability to just draw a very specific emotion out of an expression that really like allows all of Imaishi's works to connect with people, no matter how gonzo they get. And I think it's also kind of the, the, the very unique setup that Trigger has for an animation studio, because they don't really rely on project freelancers and keyframe animators. They, most of their staff is in-house and people that they work for 10 years. And because of that, Imaishi and the team has a lot of confidence in their team. Not that, you know, when you do an anime, you don't have confidence in the team that you assembled, but there's a very different vibe uh, when you when you worked with certain people and you know you can push them in a certain way and try new things with them because the default already is great. So let's try something new there and maybe do it quite differently. And that luxury of, you know, setting up for failure, that's a possibility. That's also something that's not really common in anime. That sense the schedule is mm-hmm. relentless. And, uh, you know, it was here as well, for sure. Yeah. But... But, yeah, no, the anime industry, like... I imagine even coming from the game industry, there was some shock as to, like, how fast the turnarounds on projects are at most studios and, and how, like how much outsourcing there is, how brutal the conditions are, like, it's, it's... One of the things that um, we were really proud of <clears throat> is that we obviously had a date and everything to finish, but whatever the team was in need, 
Like we, we had the luxury of saying like, going to push it, it's fine. And I think that helped a lot in the quality of things that are on screen. Because at the end of the day, <clears throat> I think I can confidently say that nobody was killing themselves for making this show, which I think is a rarity in the business. That's that's almost unheard of, honestly, in anime production. Like uh, outside of Trigger, Kyoto Animation, uh, Bones, and I think uh, Toei has pretty good hours and pay too. But uh, and you photo. There's a few studios that that like treat their their workers well. But like for the most part, it's sixty hour work weeks for less money than you'd make doing 40 hours at a 7-Eleven. But I think this this has to change. And I hope in certain ways edge runners might help uh, in a sense that um, it is quite clear that the skill set that is in Japan is very unique. Like, of course, mm -hmm. Castlevania was actually, most of the people don't know, but it was done in the US. Powerhouse Animation did that. Really talented guys there, yeah, yeah. Definitely. And actually people that worked mostly on anime, because they worked their pipeline of like Spencer One, for example, who is you know, he worked on Naruto and Boruto and, and many other things. So he knows the pipeline and he transferred that pipeline into the States and kind of went with it and he, he gathered a lot of people that were foreigners but worked in Japan for shows before. But in general I do hope that uh, there'll be more money in the industry. People get better wages because if this skill set disappears and everything is 3D, I think there will be a tremendous loss for creativity and for for the unique art that is anime. So I do hope that you know we have a really big push from big companies that have money to go in and kind of uh, present really cool projects with bigger budgets and more time. Because even yeah. now, people are like, oh, let's make this show and this should, but it's not that easy. It's like, really, if you think about it, this show took almost like, if you talk about pure pre-production that we knew what we were doing, like we settled on things, it was four years. If you count all the pre-production, it was six years. So of course, once we found it, <laughs> Like it was easier, but at least for us, it was really it, hard to find it. Yeah, to find what the show would be. Yeah, and how it would look. Yeah. And why does it exist? And how does it exist? And if it exists in this specific space, does it have something interesting to say in this space? Right? Because nobody wants to do a worse something. Like you don't want to be referred to like it's a it's a lesser whatever show. Nobody wants to yeah. do that. But so many people end up making exactly that kind of show because they they you know they end up on on like a video game project because there's so many that launch every season sure. in in Japan. You know that every time a new video game is in production, there's some kind of talk about are we going to do an anime? And they you know they get with the production committees and. It's always like it's always dictated by the release schedule for the game. Um, you know, COVID set that off by like a few months for some productions, but like they still came back and, and came out as quickly as they could. And like it's really not common for an anime, especially a licensed anime, but for anime in general to be given this sort of done when it's done schedule. Uh, you know, to be allowed to be as good as they can be instead of as good as they can be in the time allowed. Uh, out, like, outside of film, it doesn't really happen. And... But but I think... It, yeah, like... But it also, I think, is connected to the business model. Like, if mm -hmm. our anime was done in a very different model, which is, like, we finance it from the minute we, you know, went into the room uh, with our own money... So there was no committee, there was no CDs to sell, no merchandise to sell. Like, of course this matters, like it's a business, not a charity. But if it's not really the reason of doing a thing, 
then it becomes mm-hmm. quite different. And I think this might become more prevalent in the industry in general. Because if it's not the committee that goes in and says, this amount of CDs, this amount of figurines, this, then you kind of unleash something good. And I think even the numbers that anime right now does in American cinema, for example, kind of propels the medium in a very different way. Like 10 years ago, I wouldn't think any of this is possible. <laughs> but now we're yeah. in a space where it's like, yeah, anime is mainstream. <laughs> and it's, it's kind of weird because, honest to God, when I went into my first con- anime convention in Poland when I was 12, it was in my small city and there was like 200 people. And, you know, <laughs> everybody was watching, you know, Ghost in the Shell and Tenchi Muyo on VHS. Like there's a whole room with like a CRTV and, and, and just screening shows that somebody sent from the US from a VHS tape or whatever. Like to this, I would never thought that's even a remote possibility. Uh, but it is. And I hope this, like in 10 years, we'll just laugh about this point in time of like, yeah, this is way more now. I I hope so. I, I really hope so. Um, and like, yeah, I, I think the both the like artistic reception to Edge Runners, but also the way that it has like demonstrably done numbers for for CD Projekt Red, right? That is, I hope the th- like the thing that that the business end in Japan will actually take notice of, because like I think this proves that when you give a team time to make something really good, that gives the audience an an entry point that's not just here's a thing you might be interested in that we're advertising to you as cheaply as possible through this tv slot it's here's a thing that potentially you're gonna love right like you didn't set out to make an anime that was for everybody you set out to make something that weird little geeks like you and me would fucking love to pieces right and that has created an enthusiasm for the whole brand and the game that that wasn't there before because that emotional attachment was it wasn't the same sure if that makes sense if that makes sense it's my hope that the the anime industry and you know more importantly the the game and publishing industries because ultimately they have more control over what anime gets made than most anime studios do will see how well this has done and maybe rethink their approach to getting their stuff out there well let me tell you like it it was when i signed uh, trigger it was already extremely hard to get a slot in any studio for the next couple of years when that happened. And I, we started to speak, in fact, I think in 2017. So now, <laughs> if I go to Japan and try to sign off a studio for a new project, let's say it's whatever, my my project, I'm going to finance it as, as Rafa. <laughs> mm-hmm. I think I'll have to wait three, four years unless I assemble my own team in a sense that I get the freelancers that are on the market and get them into one entity and say, this is what we're going to do. All of the major companies have either Netflix deals that, uh, you know, they, they have pipeline that's covered for them. They already have existing shows that they have to do multiple seasons of, and there's not enough talent actually to make all of the things that are already on the ground. So even if somebody comes with a huge amount of money and say, we're going to pay three times whatever everybody else is paying, like there might not be a possibility to do anything because the pipelines are already filled for five years or so. So that's an interesting conundrum that the industry has to face. I, what's it, like? What's crazy to me about that is like, normally when an industry has that kind of supply imbalance right 
the prices go up, but like anime studios are still, you know, s signing contracts at the same dog shit rate that they have since since you know the days of Tezuka. Um, like it's from my experience, it has changed a lot. Like it the has? numbers, yeah, the numbers I've seen in 2015. And the numbers I've seen in 2018 were already two to three times higher in, in between those two years. I can only imagine now it's even more, but it's also because in the last 10 years, the global anime community has grown to a such an extent. So now Netflix has invested a lot into the industry, but mm. what was done is that they book, they like studios want to have paychecks for their employees so they book in advance for a long time and because of that you know if you book your studio for three years you negotiate the rates at that specific moment in time right you don't mm -hmm. count for inflation because japan has no inflation actually it's deflation yeah uh so it's sh it should have grown r more rapidly but i think it grows Basically, each time that the pipeline is exhausted and new negotiations are happening. So I think because of that, there's like intervals of years in interchanging there. Mm hmm. I, yeah, yeah, no, that makes sense that there'd be like a time lag with, with the, uh, I mean, yeah, because it is four years out to any production, so it makes sense there'd be a time lag with how the, the prices adjust. But, I mean, all what was the budget, if you don't mind me asking, per Can't episode? Sorry. Can't tell me. Yeah. But it was higher than, than the industry standard, right? Yes. Yeah, and that's... Because I read this, this crazy statistic a couple years ago that the average budget for an anime is just, just north of $100,000. And like, from my experience with all the studios I spoke to, it's way more. Or per episode. Per episode. Per it's episode. Way more. I mean, yeah, yeah. It's way more. It's way more now. Okay, because that was a stat back in 2015, 2017. But uh... it makes sense that because if you think about the seasonal anime that is churned, and that might be the case. My experience might have been quite different because I spoke with, you know all the big studios out there you know all the map and, and you were map, also right so yeah and you were also on a bespoke project as yeah. opposed to something for television yeah. um so yeah you had your own um you had your own schedule and your own priorities and stuff like that 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 would have changed that but but yeah but i want to say like sorry obviously the situation isn't good <laughs> I'm not saying that the slightest, but I, I do see a lot of change. Imp and I think also because artists now have more options than they have 10 years ago. There's this site, for example, in Japan called skeb.jp where people like commission stuff. And there's many people that originally that did animation that just go there and they, they take five or 10 times per drawing that they would make uh, as an animator. And that's their way of living right now. And there's a lot of Japanese creators that can work with foreign entities, even if they don't speak the language. Uh, so there's a lot of more opportunity there for really great artists to kind of export their talent outside. So that's why the imbalance, um, that's why actually <laughs> foreigners are actually the new strengths in the Japanese animation industry. That's why you have so many uh, uh, foreigners in, in, in spotlight, uh, because there's not a lot of Japanese creators that want to do it. And I understand why, but I do like, I truly hope that in the next five years or so, this dramatically shifts and we have a still very demanding industry, but that, you know, allows people creators to live in a good way. Yeah, I I hope so too because I don't want to see like I love anime, right? Like anime is my favorite thing, and I'm worried that the alternative to them figuring this out is yeah, just all of the creators going to Skeb because 
that's where the money is and and the industry you know just sort of choking itself out of the talent it needs to continue the the people who get to make those decisions they're not going to look at the critical reception to edge runners necessarily as anything more than oh well i mean this might have helped its its reach or whatever but i do think that they will look at at the the impact that it's had on the audience for the rest of the property and see some opportunities there i hope if nothing else you guys have made one of like one of the best animes of the year in a year that's like stacked pretty freaking stacked <laughs> well yeah. you know i'm i don't want to you know uh as an anime fan i'm i'm pretty glad we made it before chainsaw man because honestly, God, <laughs> it's like, I love Chainsaw Man. I think it's one of the best pieces of fiction in the recent 10 years that we got. It's so quirky out there, but so grounded as well. The visuals are amazing. The storytelling is amazing. It's so sincere. Like the sincerity is like on its sleeve and it's so great. I love it. Uh, so it's very clear for me that it's going to be the next big thing for the industry so uh, yeah I'm, I'm, and it's already like it's it's already bigger than a lot of a a a manga that have gotten anime yeah it's yeah so were you behind the scenes like guys guys we gotta we gotta we gotta drop this thing before october or we're <laughs> screwed was, was that <laughs> no we didn't because at the time we didn't know that it's going to be at that specific time and we finished production uh, for the Japanese VO and kind of the majority of post-production in April this year. Uh, there was still English VO to be recorded and kind of marketing materials to be produced and trailers and st stuff like that. But we finished the production of the anime in, uh, in April this year. So well, actually not the production, like the post-production in that, in that sense uh, of the Japanese VO at least. So, so yeah, we... We had to wait to catch up on other things that we need to do in post-production and with the marketing campaign, but also kind of, you have to have a good spot when Netflix is releasing because you don't want to be squished between mm. like huge live action movies with Dwayne The Rock Johnson and Ryan Reynolds or whatever, right? Because then there's less, more op less opportunity to shine. So we had to kind of agree on the window as well. But yeah, but I'm pretty happy. Like we spoke with the producers <laughs> the, on CDPR's end that, yeah, everybody's super happy that we didn't go head to head with Chainsaw Man because I think both would have lost some of that spotlight and that's not necessary for, for it to, mm -hmm. to go there. And I'm so, so hyped for that show personally that I wouldn't want to kind of <laughs> feel bad about it. And I don't, so that's... Cool. Yeah, th that would have been the worst to just be like, oh, my show's not doing good and it's because of one of my favorite things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would have sucked. So nobody wants that. The last thing that I'd want to ask is, as somebody with this experience now, um, if another game company were to approach you and be like, we want to make something that's good, that helps people connect with our IP in the same way that Edge Runners did with Cyberpunk, right? Mm -hmm. What would your advice be to, to somebody trying to make an adaptation of a video game, anime specifically or in general, that's not dog shit? <laughs> that's a low bar, actually, but... I would just say rely on the creators that really love the IP and do what it is uh, in a sense that if your video game or comic book, whatever you want to bring uh, to the world is about a specific thing, like lean into that, like go as hard or as strong as you possibly can, because the audience will feel if this is like, I've never played the game. But I really, like, I read a lot of wikis and lore. Or somebody that loves the game told me why they love it. No, you have to have it in your heart. Why do you love it? And if if you have that, I'm, and you find really great collaborators in that, in, in that sense that share that kind of experience, that will push you. Because also, one of the things that are great about Trigger is that they re we really pushed each other, like, to a brink <laughs> all the time. 
but that was like, it was tough while producing but the what you see on the screen is is because of that that push so find a partner that can push you like truly can push you and will not just yeah yeah yes we'll do whatever you want and we'll go along and find somebody to drive it that really loves it that makes sense so so to like put it another way you need people on the producer side who understand the ip and what makes it great and have a clear idea of what the core message needs to be and then you also need a creative team that's going to bring their own vision to the product think about batman for example batman is so many things right you have lego mm -hmm. batman you have you know very realistic batman you have like fantasy batman that you know is green lantern and you know goes to the moon and whatever like you have so many iterations of batman but at all times if the creators loved batman and found a way to tell a new story about him it worked mm -hmm. it always works because if if there's a new thing that you want to say through that character or there's a really complex thing that you want to shine a different light then already you're in a path to success in my mind because it's the thing that we're doing right now with video games and anime for instance, is not very new actually it's actually very old like if you look at many mediums that were there it was done but actually for video games nobody took those lessons seriously it was just like let's make a you know a blockbuster silly movie and everybody will come because the video game is big actually right. no nobody will come actually nobody will love it but if you find a way to love it uh then it will most likely be a success that's i think that's a really good takeaway um i think that pretty much answers my question um the other like the other thing that gets that i think is a mistake that a lot of game publishers make when when trying to go into movies is just adapting the story of the game wholesale but I, um but i think for example last of us is like today maybe we'll get a trailer uh from the show and i think that story really needs to be told in this different medium as well because i think it will mm. draw from different emotional things because if you play the last of us and you have to go through that prologue and you have to actually walk it's a very different feeling that if you see it on screen but i think yeah i think this this story can and should be told in different mediums but the same story where i think there will be if we adapted the story of v to the anime it will be tragically detrimental that to the whole story because it's not structured in that way like the last of us is basically mm -hmm. a uh, the most advanced hybrid of movie and video game <laughs> so you can take it's it's also not a power fantasy yeah it's very grounded about emotions and people and connections yeah i think so yeah i think this i've read about like there's a lot of twitter that talks to me about halo and the tv show halo which again i don't want to uh, put down any creators because i'm sure everybody worked extremely hard yeah. on this show but people tweet at me like, oh, I wish Halo was more this and that. But I think it's just about, uh, there was a, an, an, uh, an animated, I think even an anime for like a short uh, for Halo. And it was about Spartans and didn't have uh, Master Chief or anything. But it really was about what Halo is about. And I think once you capture that, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. I, th I think I agree with that. Okay, last question. Um, and thank you for sticking around with me so long. This has been a great interview. Um, last question. If there's any video game that you could adapt into an anime or movie or whatever, or any anime that you could make, make use your producer connections to get turned into an anime, um, or to get turned into a game. So any anime you could turn into a game or any game you could turn into an anime, what pro uh, who, what would it be? What would that dream project be? I can't say because then I can't do it. 
<laughs> okay. Sorry, but this has to remain with with me. Uh, there's a there's a ton. I think there's a ton of things that people love, and if the right setup is there, the right amount of thrust, like I think we're in, we're we're going to see a lot more of really great things that people will fall in love with. And not that it didn't happen before, like every season of seasonal anime for me, and I watch, try to watch majority of things that go out there for many years. It's like, there's always a, a thing that I love for a bizarre mm -hmm. reason, right? It's like, oh, this is so wholesome. I didn't need, I didn't know I need this. Or this is like, a, oh, it's a shonen anime about Hanafuda cards. <laughs> Who would have known that this is compelling, <laughs> right? But, um, but yeah, but, but I, I you got to talk to Pro ZD sometime. <laughs> he also loves that series. Um, but yeah, no, I, yeah, I I love the seasonal, like discovering new stuff every season too. Like that, so I I, yeah, I, I get what you're saying there. But like, I also hope that we get more stuff like Edge Runners and like Arcane that's like this polished and has that much time in the oven. Cause like, I mean, if you if you've been on the seasonal beat, you probably watched Akudama Drive, yeah, um, and probably enjoyed that. And that's you know in in a similar ballpark to Edge Runners, but like, there's also just a lot of points where you can tell they didn't have the time to polish it like they wanted to. Well, and and it's an original creation, as far as I understand, right? It was an original concept from the start. And I think mm -hmm. we Edge Runners benefited hugely because there was almost ten years of pre-production on the game that Trigger can draw mm -hmm. from. Because they they we had to figure out a lot of things, but we didn't have to figure out a lot of things. And because of that, that time can go into making the story better or making the animation shine more. Because we didn't have to think, okay, if you open up a cyberware arm. Does it go this way or this way? Or does it like go, right? We, could, we had those pieces that we already established. And it's uh, because of that, I think, that we, we got the opportunity to make things a little bit better. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, but I think also the ONA release schedule compared to yeah, television sure. must have helped a lot. For sure. Yeah, we weren't rushing yeah. to hit a specific thing of course there were deadlines don't get me wrong for everything yeah but a every big project has deadlines but at the end of the day if we needed more time we got more time well i'm i'm glad that you got that time because i mean like i said it's one of the best shows i've seen this year and like i think it is my favorite trigger anime like i've i've i think that the new stuff that you brought to the table there was to an extent something that Trigger's been missing or not missing, but something that really complements their style of story well. And they were, and... And they were really like one of the reasons why they agreed to this really ludicrous idea was that they wanted to lean into those things. Like we didn't push it on them and they were like, no, no, we want, no, no. They were like, they were excited that they can do as much gore as they want, that they be, can be as dark as they want, <laughs> that they can we have a porn team, and that's fine. That's That was fun. Fun in the sense that there was no that, invitation. And I think... That, that scene was one of the <laughs> craziest... Th like, I, I I was like, poof! I thought Devilman would... Poof. <laughs> no, because I think they were excited that they can lean into this. And I think because of that excitement... We, we we pushed that direction for sure, but they were excited to embrace that. So I think this also helped because if they were uh, reluctant, this wouldn't work as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You got to have enthusiastic participants on both sides of the production. Because yeah. um, if, if the people making it aren't having fun, then the audience isn't going to. Yeah, for sure. Uh, well, thank you so much, Rafal, for uh, you know talking to me about all of this. I, it's, it's been I've learned a lot <laughs> about like everything that went into this show, and and like 
current state of the industry stuff that I didn't that I I wasn't up to date on. <sighs> I mean, we we both just love anime a lot. At the end of the day, I think that's the the and you've been lucky to have like a chance to maybe have that impact, but at least like take characters who were in your head and and like hand them over to an artist you look up to and trust and see them make something of that, right? And don't get me wrong, like I still am pinching myself all the fucking time because literally if you if you look about say, a guy from a small town in Poland was managed yeah. managed to kind of, you know, go with one of the best animation studios in the world and create something together. That's a crazy coincidence. Like in like regardless of talent and my hard work or whatever, that's just that's just a fluke in many ways. So I'm so happy yeah. like, I'm so grateful and happy that that happened to me, but I will never take it for granted. If I never do anything ever, at least I did this. <laughs> well, I I hope we get to see that you do more cool things in the future. Um, but I can definitely, that sentiment makes a lot of sense. This is an achievement and, and I mean, you're, I'm sure your whole team is immensely proud, but like, I, you know, the whole time that I saw this, I was like new trigger anime. I'm excited for it. But like, you know, I expected a licensed anime, you know, that would have been fun and, sure. and like, you know, had some trigger energy. You really manage your teams together really managed to bring out the soul, I think, of what makes the writing behind CD Projekt Red's games so strong and what makes Trigger's production so strong in a way that elevates both. And I... Yeah, I, I like. I think that this is an anime people will be talking about, not just like a year from now, but ten years from now, as like. I sure hope so, man. One of the greats. You know, you you never know. Like everybody's trying to make the new best thing, and you know, we gave it a shot, did our best, and I hope there's way more ahead of us in cool anime because I really want to watch it. <laughs> <laughs> I want to watch it too. I really want to watch it too. Um, so I, I hope that whatever you're working on now that you can't talk about uh, turns out just as awesome as this did. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. Thank you for, for coming on to talk uh, with me, man. It's been a pleasure to so pick much. your brain. Um, and yeah, I... I, I I hope we get to talk again sometime, um, you know, on your next project or yeah, just whenever. <laughs> Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. And uh, yeah, it was like a, almost like a, you know, uh, convention kind of talk on the hallway, right? Where it's like you, you speak with mm. people that share the passion and you want to kind of share your insights with them. Uh, yeah, it's really cool. Thank you so much. <laughs>